Our next speaker is Joshua Miller, Associate Professor, the Department of English and Language and Literature at the University of Michigan. The title of his talk today is Homo Diaspora, Reading Futurist Language Fictions as Translational Histories. Welcome, Joshua. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I always have microphone anxieties. Um, I thought many of you had uh, to fear who was coming before you. And uh, now I, I feel certain that I'm the one who has the hardest act to follow. So I'll just say that. Um, something that's, that Allison said that is uh, very much on my mind now is how difficult it is to uh, speak at the end of such a rich and extraordinary uh, gathering. And so um, in my talk, as well as in my you know, thanks, which are to come in about four seconds, uh, you'll hear repetitions. And so I'll just have to hope that Gertrude Stein was right and there is no such thing as repetition. Um, otherwise, I'm in big trouble. So I'll start by thanking Chantal and David um, all of the um, students, the staff members, um, everybody here who has made this um, really an extraordinary gathering, um, as well as the speakers. This is, as I've been telling some of you, uh, for me, a little bit like hearing my bibliography talk to me because um, of how much your, your, the work collectively that you've done has influenced me. So it's been very, very um, helpful and important to me. Okay, so, oops. I just destroyed this perfect balance. Okay, um, so my talk today has a few purposes. Uh, I work on language politics in 20th century US literature and film. Uh, my subject today is a new topic. This is my first talk on this text. Um, so since it's a departure from my prior work, I'm gonna give a little bit of contextual background for uh, the kind of work that I'm doing now. And um, that's the end of my preamble. I will now amble. A flurry of 21st century novels and films have appeared that could be described as linguistic dystopian fiction, or perhaps science language fiction is a better moniker for it. Channeling apocalyptic millennial sentiments of both comfortable cosmopolitans and desperate transnational migrants, such science language fiction represent futurist or alternative multilingual worlds in which the semiotic and translational problems generate ontological ruptures. But what do the language-based crises depicted in such novels as China Mieville's Embassy Town, 2011, and Ben Marcus's The Flame Alphabet, 2012, signify? One could quickly compose a lengthy list of examples of such science language fiction that emerged from the late 19th century on through the 20th century. One of the many intriguing dimensions for me of this, of the most recent iterations of this genre is that they have an, an intertextual dialogue with a longer tradition of linguistic narratives of science fiction and the experimental art and global politics of um, supranational and auxiliary languages and, and sort of plans and projects and schemes. Rather Rather than attempting a more synoptic discussion of this history and the state of these uh, texts, I'm uh, essentially going to sidestep that part of the topic uh, today in order to um, uh, kind of skate past some of the more common science fiction techniques for discussing uh, linguistic alterity or representing some of the problems of translation in science fiction uh, in order to focus on, on just one. But in order to kind of pass by it, I'll say that many works of science fiction, as you probably know, um, mediate and represent scenes of linguistic difference through universal translation mechanisms, which include machine translation and computer translation, uh, interlanguages, constructed codes, and the like. Um, they also do it through reported dialogue. So in other words, reported versions of what the conversations are, but uh, represented in English, and also as radical non-communication. So situations in which uh, the, the beings don't speak. Um, and I'll, and so I'll just be focusing on this, this one example. Uh, in my current work, I'm moving from the national language politics of multilingual US modernism to the global politics of supranational language art. As 20th and 21st century literary criticism has moved toward planetary studies, existing topics and methods have gained new relevance, such as race and border studies, migrant and refugee narratives, new media, computer coding, Creole and mixed languages, comparative and world literary studies. 
reconceptualizing literary history in relation to inter slash national language politics offers insights into and raises questions for current conversations on global planetary literatures. Linguists, critical theorists, historians, and literary critics have discussed the institutional and cultural practices responding to public debates on national monolingualism. So drawing on my discussion of these intersections in my book, Accented America, my talk centers on mixed language fiction that extrapolates from the post-national tensions of migrancy and the paradoxes linking what Svetlana Boim calls off-modern panic to lexical features of temporality in old and new media environments. Off-modern is Boim's alternative to neo-post and other afterlives of modernity, one that refers to the oblique and, she says, quote, out of sync, balancing act and form of virtuosity in, multi and this is not her, in multilingual codes. This is back to her, quote. Off is the little gift of a preposition co-created by users of a language in the past two centuries. I hear in it the traces of foreign accents. Off suggests a dimension of time and human action that is unusual or potentially off-putting and embarrassing. And this temporal dimension of multilingual speech and of translation uh, is one of the kind of key connecting features I want to suggest between the work that I've done and the work that I, I plan to do. In Accented America, I examine the cultural politics of US literary modernism as multilingual writing, immigrant, and I, I've been starting to write immigrant with a slash, so I am slash migrant, and the point here is not the kind of you know overly post-structuralist one of slashing everything, all words, uh, but rather to make a very specific point about both words and etymology and, and kind of repositioning words in our minds. And I think that uh, something I've noticed in US uh, American studies is the emphasis on immigration sometimes occludes other versions of, of movement and demographic shift that are better understood as migrant studies and refugee studies, which often are terms that don't get used in American studies, but are used in, in European and global studies. And so um, in slashing that particular word, that's something I have in mind. Uh, it sounded more violent than it was when I thought it in my head. Um, so uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, so immigrant and post-immigrant consciousness and networks narrated through experimental prose that self-reflexively mixed languages. The literary works that I discuss in this book push against a putatively national US English toward intranational multilingual works of migrants and immigrants. So the point is that these multilingual works are uh, residing definitively within the nation, not outside of it. Public debates over US language politics tend to be expressions of anxiety regarding something other than language, as others have said, and as I don't need to tell this group. As many, perhaps all of you gathered today, have argued before, language differences have served as a proxy for racial and ethnic prejudice throughout the last century, and then some. Given our location in Arizona, it will come as no surprise to any of you that language legislation, accent, and, dis and language discrimination lawsuits, as well as national debates over linguistic matters, have risen during times of increasingly visible immigration and expansion. I've argued for a long history to English-only nationalism in the US, which I trace to the 1890s period of immigration and imperialism policies. Given the unprecedented rise in non-English language speaking US residents and citizens, Due to annexation, colonization, and immigration, the question of what constituted the American language or languages was a hot button issue in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, among the pieces of this that come as kind of lexical units that we inherit, or, or actually in this case didn't, uh, were the various renamed versions of what you know American English should be called. H.L. Mencken wanted to call it American, but it was also called English with an I, I-N-G-L-I-S-H. Uh, it was also known as um, as uh, Amer English and Statish and United Statish. The rise of nativism during these decades is a well-known story, but the emergence of language as a litmus test of Americanness is less well-known to uh, audiences, um, perhaps, again, other than you. Um, and in the process of thinking about governmental and industrial Americanization programs as they uh, taught citizenship and their various subtexts, such as hygiene and health, through language lessons, the first language laws in US history uh, were, were passed at the state level in the 1920s, and the 1906 Naturalization Act was the first federal law to use language to regulate citizenship. 
And the emergence of looking at linguistics and the rise of linguistics in the 1920s in the US as the new science of language uh, and connecting it to this history of uh, US language politics, um, I was surprised to learn that during World War I, uh, some of the kinds of conversations that actually have come up in the conference um, about the relationship between academia and governmental programs uh, was taking place, in fact, during World War I. Universities and academic organizations participated in the war effort through specifically language resources. The Modern Language Association established a committee in 1917 to facilitate cooperative, cooperative effects efforts between governmental agencies and teachers of Romance languages. Courses for soldiers in war French, with textbooks titled Army French and Liberty French, were rapidly composed. Another MLA committee worked with Army Military Intelligence to nominate loyal academics for immediate translation work in a variety of US language, uh, uh, sorry, a variety of, of European languages. This history has contributed to distinctive features of US language politics, which is unusual as a society in which multilingualism has often been viewed as a marker of marginal or stigmatized identities rather than privileged social status. Um, social and cultural, meaning in, in the case that I'm talking about, literary multilingualisms have frequently been associated with polemicism as a badge of cultural radicalism, elitism, or cosmopolitanism. But in fact, no one political position is invariably associated with any particular speech form. Each can articulate any position at all. Moreover, even what appears to be a unilingual text uh, can convey disruptively anti-standardizing impulses, as any reader of, of James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Vladimir Nabokov, or Gertrude Stein certainly attest. In a comparativist project of American studies, I consider a range of authors from varied social groups, um, including Gertrude Stein, John Dos Passos, Nella Larson, Jean Toomer, Henry Roth, Lionel Trilling, Carlos Bulasan, and Americo Paredes, who deployed linguistic mixtures to literary ends. I argue that rather than celebratory, condemnatory, or polemical attitudes toward national language politics, these authors developed ambivalent narrative idioms to explore what I call a melancholic structure of lost languages within US immigrant narratives. So there's a temporal dimension within their modernist experiments with English as a mixed language evoking historical displacement and linguistic loss. Anterior languages, German, Ilocano, Spanish, African languages, and so on, haunt their improper Englishes as present absences, as etymological traces of intergenerational histories of violence that linger, though they are not remembered by individual speakers. Rather than between texts, multilingual texts or multilingual literary works deploy intratextual translation strategies. And I was sitting through Anthony Pym's talk in fear that he was going to make this point. So I'm um, relatively glad that this wasn't the subject of his talk. Um, uh, multilingual literary works deploy intratextual translation strategies from the perspective of a plurilingual US modernity that emerged out of immigration and imperial expansion. Translation in this sense is not a choice or an act, but everyday life itself. Though they require some rewiring, translation theories offer significant insights into literary representations of linguistic asymmetries as social inequality, exclusion and silencing. Translation, I'm suggesting, within multilingual US literatures is both inevitable and impossible. We might consider the ethics of the inevitability of translation, which does not refer to particular moments as discrete acts of translation, but more precisely translation as an ongoing representational process linked to epistemologies of survival. Historical and sociolinguistic studies of supranational languages, global English, Ch uh, Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, and many others, have significant consequences for both scholars and various publics. In this light, multilingual cultures and traditions appear as ongoing, not transitional or epiphenomenal dynamics of linguistic contact driven by the varied logics of migration, refugeeism, expansion, consumerist cosmopolitanism, counter-nationalisms, and acculturation. What does this mean for reading literary multilingualisms? Um, I've been arguing for an awareness of how temporality as buried pasts or possible futures resides in textual practices of translation and language mixing. Literary representations of language crises can stage micro moments of translation as contingent, changing, context-rich sets of ongoing processes, rather than as a discrete act of translation from source to target, um, or as a timeless and universal one, a translation that stands the test of time. Instead, literary multilingualisms frequently play with mistranslations, puns, and continually changing meanings. 
Because they often reflect the fluidity and instability of linguistic meaning, multilingual works can sometimes feel very dated quickly or archaic. You might read a book or see a movie and kind of cringe when you hear or read or see a multilingual scene and think, oh no, we don't talk that way anymore. That's so 90s or you know, last year or something like that. And um, I think, I, I, I haven't figured this out yet, but um, I actually think that has something to do with the nationalist imperative to uh, forget non-English languages, at least in the US. I think there's a, a kind of time-based relationship between the anxieties of, of attempting to forget languages in some way that these texts end up, the kind of process of linguistic change for multilingual cultures. Um, considering multilingualism as a strategy of contingent translation is one way to recognize the durability and continuous presence of US multilingual communities in spite of the violent demands of national mon monolingualism. So now is the clumsy transition to science fiction, although there's a connection. So the title, uh, working title I have for this section is From World Lit to World's Lit? Question mark. And then a quote, uh, science fiction is another language. It's a truism of our emergent field of multilingual studies that no era in US history is without language politics conflicts, but each location in time and space has its own nexus of, transition, of ten tensions and transitions. As a result of its effort to narrate foreign words, foreign worlds and words, and alien cognition, science fiction encompasses a particularly and peculiar, peculiarly fascinating set of off-modern representational problematics. Ben Marcus's novel published earlier this year, The Flame Alphabet, is a linguistic apocalypse with ethnic particularist undercurrents. Science fiction meets the immigrant novel, or The Road, recoded as resulting from a Jewish immigrant linguistic virus. The novel literalizes the notion of a communicable disease by presenting a deadly disease transmitted through children's speech. Uh, and I'm not actually going to be talking about it, but what results in it is, in fact, uh, relatively quick death of all listeners of the speech. Um, so this novel, uh, The um, Flame Alphabet and Embassy Town, join a fairly lengthy list in recent, of recent apocalyptic fi futurism, including umpteen films, many memorable and many not. As many have noted, such works channel early 21st century uh, in information age anxieties regarding code, privacy, ecological erosion, and what Emmanuel Wallerstein termed the decline of American power. Many have written about science fiction and the politics and poetics of utopian and dystopian fantasy, uh, but I want to focus my discussion on the semiotics of linguistic apocalypses. The queer African American science fiction author Samuel Delaney famously argued that science fiction is the only fiction of the present. All other genres respond to concerns of the past. In asserting this line, uh, um, in asserting this point regarding time, that science fiction is about the present because it, it reaches toward the future, um, reading temporality as and through language, Delaney also suggests that science fiction is crucially shaped by a hermeneutics of extrapolation or extension, reaching from the present into speculative futurities. The spatial metaphor here for time as both space and language is important to my reading of China Mayeville's novel, as well as to my suggestion regarding one type of literary multilingualism. Mark Bold has, has observed that since science fiction is centrally occupied, and I didn't actually realize I was using that term, it's sort of not uh, in our current moment, probably the right word. Uh, since science fiction uh, is frequently taken with, um, quote, imagining alternative societies and encounters with non-human others, frequent references to linguistic and communicational dilemmas is unsurprising. What is more notable is that, he writes, quote, science fiction tends to privilege other sciences and often neglects linguistics, which results in what several scholars have described as a striking contrast between the wealth of language problems in science fiction and the relative poverty of linguistic explanation. Nation. Mieville's nine previous novels are famously genre bending. Like Jonathan Lethem and others of his generation, Mieville became known for works that mix techniques and themes of several genres, including fantasy, the grotesque, science fiction, urbanism, period fiction, and so on. In this respect, Embassy Town is a more conventional narrative than his other works. If less surprising, formally, however, never fear unimaginably strange developments do indeed take place. I'm actually just sort of curious, how many of you have read China Mieville's work, uh, novels in the past? Okay, good, buckle up. Um, 
So uh, in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Neil Easterbrook ran through a few of what he identified as embassy towns. Uh, he called them robust display of genre conventions, both traditional and innovative. And here they are. Here's his list. Murder, a coup, lotus eaters, messianic prophecy, war, martyrdom, perfidy, viral suicides, marauding zombie hordes, clones commit doppelside, press ganging occurs by dismemberment, bio rig, Biorigged plants shit food, and aliens discover semiotics. Crises abound, political and existential, theological and biological. That's his uh, kind of quick version of the novel. Play with temporality in Embassy Town is fairly subtle. The story is told in a retrospective first person, so the futurism of the context is described in the past tense. The scale of the immer, interstellar space, requires travel at an indescribably high speed and creates an alt reality in which humans age at different paces. Time is measured in kilo hours rather than years. And the human, although the human narrator, Avis Brenner, Ch Brenner Cho, an immernaut, slips back into human time scales from time to time. Interstellar space is called the always. Um, one other formal feature relating to time in the novel is that the first half of the book is told in alternating chapters in two unexplained different times, so that the events narrated took place in a sequence uh, different than its narration. Uh, I think the word is pronounced terras, humans. Um, in the novel, speak a language called anglo ubic but in order to represent the distant future imagined in embassy town, the novel is told through a consistent multilingual future speak, employing neologisms for objects or concepts that don't exist today. However, unlike most literary multilingualisms, uh, including the ones I referred to earlier, um, Mieville doesn't translate any of his, of his new words, since that would violate the fiction of the story, which is that Avis is telling, telling her tale to an unnamed listener in a future time, and her unnamed listener will know all of the words she's using, so the novel doesn't tell us what they mean. Narratologically, this is a subtle but important literary mode of uh, multilingualism, since there are no in-group readers who know the code, unless some of you are covert time travelers. The history embedded in the work's language mixing hasn't happened yet. The mixed idiom of the narrative has a similarly defamiliarizing quality as those of modernists, such as Joyce, Stein, Dos Passos, and others. One of my um, kind of realizations and mind changing moments happened as I was reading the novel. Um, and this never actually hasn't, this doesn't take place in the words of the novel. This is just my own uh, kind of realization or, or minor um, epiphany, which is that the words uh, phoneme, the basic unit of sound and language, and phenome, the you know, genetic term um, are identical aside from one transposed vowel. And the relationship between genetics and language has kind of happened a few times today. So uh, I don't actually have any idea what to make of that little sort of connection, but um, it felt somehow connected to the ways in which I was dislodged by the ling linguistic experience of the novel. Um, so I ha actually have to do something a little bit strange because I'm just noticing that I uh, don't have all the rest of my pages of my talk. So I'm going to walk over. Yep. I'm going to give you a chance to take a breath. Uh, I'm going to fervently hope that I have it with me. And if not, um, I'm going to make something up. Yes. We're all very relieved by this. Thanks. OK, so um, as you can imagine, the plot of Embassy Town is dense, twisty, and far too complex to recount in full. I certainly couldn't do it without my notes, so I would have been in huge trouble. Um, so I'll basically be focusing on the setup of the novel and its plot resolution. And so I want to say now that uh, I will essentially be spoiling the story for some of you uh, while also not explaining how, in the kind of rich detail of the novel, these, these events are interesting. So you're getting the worst of both worlds if you get up and leave at this moment. I won't think you're protesting uh, my talk, but simply really excited about the novel. Um, but feel free. Um, in her travels, Avis finds love in the hotel bar where it happens a linguistics conference is taking place. And I remind you at this point, this is science fiction. She meets Sile, a linguist who is fascinated by the unique language of the indigenous beings of Avis's home planet, which I think is pronounced Arieka. 
For his sake, they moved to Embassy Town, the city where she grew up. Embassy Town is on a backwater planet so far removed from the Imperial Metropole that ships their supplies for their continued life on the planet that the human community uh, only receives these shipments uh, with such infrequency that they essentially map time in relationship to their, the arrival um, of, those, of their supplies. The planet exists at the very edge of the known universe, the end of the always. Communication across the Immer is possible, but difficult and slow. The indigenous Ariekai, to whom the humans refer to quaintly as hosts, because they are in fact hosting the humans, are, quote, insect, horse, coral fan things. They are dominant beings who rule the planet, but have allowed humans to create a city there and have aided them by sharing their bio-rigging, that's Mieville's term, techniques through which they create living architecture and objects out of organic matter. Buildings breathe and sweat, and so on. Among many other distinctively Mievillian bizarre physical features, the Ariekai have hooves, hear through fan wings, they have eyes at the end of mobile uh, coral-like shafts, and most importantly for our purposes, two mouths. Each utterance of Arakai language, and it's always capitalized and that becomes important, must be articulated by both of their mouths simultaneously. Human linguists, in the novel that is, um, represent their speech as a mathematical fraction, calling the top word the cut and the lower half the turn. For example, one host's name, and I was going to do this as a visual representation, but since it would be essentially one slide, that felt incredibly lame, so I decided not to do that. So one of these host's names is uh, the top half of the fraction is Searle, S-U-R-L, and the, the bottom half um, underneath the horizontal line is Tesh Escher. The novel never explains why, but Ariakai can only understand words communicated by a sentient being. So speech generated by a computer, recorded on a machine, or otherwise originating from a non-conscious source sounds only like noise to their auditory fan wings. It, identical phonemes voiced by a living being form comprehensible language. A structural feature of the Arakai language is that it is entirely non-referential and non-symbolic. As a literal system of communication, their signifiers adhere to their signifieds, so the Arakai cannot employ any figurative language of any kind. They cannot lie, and even the hint of a partial truth is succulently titillating. Uh, Easterbrook, in his review, phrases this particular paradox of their doubled voice and, um, and non-symbolic language nicely. He says, quote, while the hosts always have polyphony, they do not have polysemy. The two words always have one meaning. Because language represents the boundaries of their thought, when they have need to describe a phenomenon as yet unnamed, they must create an actual situation to have the words to describe it. This is their workaround to have a semblance of figurative language. When the need arises, the hosts request the presence of a, of a single human who has to act out event, an event without knowing the script. As a young girl, Avis is chosen to be a simile. So she undergoes a difficult experience that she describes as just short of traumatizing and becomes, quote, a human girl who in pain ate what was given her in an old room built for eating in which eating had not happened for a long time. The simile is shortened in time to the girl who ate what was given to her. Because the Arakai do not distinguish between word and referent, Avis becomes a part of language. She is not like a simile, she is a simile. Since the Arakai and the humans can't communicate, some humans learn to understand language, but they are one mouth short of being able to speak it. Two separate humans cannot speak together because they lack the requisite mutual empathy or understanding to speak as one. To solve the problem of keeping the peace between the hosts and the human colonials, genetically engineered pairs of clones have been created who are trained to speak language. These ambassadors function as diplomat translators and become the controlling force of both groups because they are the only conduit through which the exotypes, which are species, um, can communicate. The novel's central plot is set in motion when a new ambassador arrives. Unlike all others, Ezra and the Doppel ambassadors have names that are compounds of shorter ones. So one is Ez and the other is Ra. And there's another one called Brendan, Bran, and Dan. Uh, Ezra was not cloned, and the two bodies look nothing alike. They, individual ambassadors, are referred to by plural pronouns. They turn out to be not clones, but a new form of doppel, computer rigged by the imperial government to link an unusual hyper empath individual to another person such that they fulfill the necessary shared personhood to speak language. 
What emerges is catastrophic because Ezra's speech induces a drug-like ecstasy and then addiction among the hosts. They quickly crave and then require Ezra's voice to be broadcast in speakers throughout the city. And what, what it creates is what Mieville calls a narco, nar, I don't know how to say this word, narcocracy, narco, nar, narcocracy of language. This paralyzing and then deadly mass addiction spreads virally through language, which parallels Ben Marcus's novel, The Flame Alphabet, as well as other works. Um, but it also recalls scenes of fascist demagoguery and new media diffusion of ideas and images. Ezra turns out to be, quote, an elegant imperial maneuver that Mel Mieville glosses in an elusive sentence that uh, I think we all wish we could have written, counter revolution through language pedagogy and bureaucracy. Rebelling against the narcotic speech of Ezra, which renders them unable to disobey, a small and then extraordinarily large, meaning almost all, group of hosts rip off their fan wings, which is extraordinarily savage because they're described as being more sensitive than eyeballs. This brutal self-deafening act of ripping off the thing with which they hear um, renders the archai languageless radically isolated with no means of conveying or receiving communication. Despite the world nearly coming to an end, uh, Avis pauses to ponder the linguist's conundrum of whether or not the hosts in denying themselves language have also robbed themselves of thought. The answer comes in to her with an astonishing discovery that the languageless constitute immediately a brutally effective army recruiting unlimited involuntary members by removing their fan wings savagely and creating what Mieville calls an unsociety of psychopaths by tearing out their social mind. The name, which is actually an interlingual pun, is they're called the absurd and um, all out warfare develops and the bio rigged breathing biopolis and its inhabit inhabitants are, are mostly uh, decimated. The resolution of the plot, which I will not in fact completely spoil, involves Avis, other human similes, a small group of Arakai who have learned to lie, and a cleaved doppel, his other half has died, who create an inspired moment of classroom instruction under threat of annihilation. The linguist, remember him? He doesn't end well. More interesting to me than the plot resolution, which frankly I think undercuts some of the more interesting elements of linguistic theory in the novel, is that the moment when the archive learn figurative language using lies to tell the truth is the moment when the narrative idiom itself emerges as newly multilingual. Near the end of the book, since the exotypes, humans and hosts, now speak and think in parallel ways, um, I just lost my place. Uh, near the end, as the humans and the hosts think in more parallel ways, the novel represents this by including untranslated bits of language. The language of the future is called anglo arakai I'll conclude here with just a few points to kind of round, off, round this all off. Although Embassy Town picks up on concepts from an enormous, an enormous range of thinkers, Hegel, Milton, and Swift lurk, as do Saussure, Worf, and Jakobsen. Passages evoke Derrida, Foucault, and Althusser. But Mieville's novel principally draws upon slightly earlier, earlier than those last uh, grouping of, of theorists. Um, his acknowledgments page lists philosophers Paul Ricoeur and Tran Doc Tao and literary critic I.A. Richards and his epigraph cites the usually omnipresent Walter Benjamin. These figures make sense given Mark Mayville's Marxist cultural criticism and materialist rather than post-structuralist attempt to uh, render language empire and the hypermassification of media. Ricoeur and Thau figure prominently in both the embodied materialist formations of language and in Avis's pedagogical intervention, transforming the absurd into um, newly, newly languaged beings. Traces of Richard's The Meaning of Meaning, which is his 1923 well-known book, and his work in basic English as a project of global auxiliary, auxiliary languages recur as well. The novel's language politics are decidedly anti-purist and intended to extend and complicate conceptions of mixture and pluralism. The only moments of satisfying physical intimacy occur when um, in Avis's affair with an ambassador, which is described as um, sort of enjoyably perverse. Um, and the novel concludes with a newly warm greeting, which relates through words, Arakai and humans. When Avis teaches French to a host that she happens to have nicknamed Spanish dancer, 
The host replies by speaking the same sentence in French and English through its two mouths, thus inventing through um, its polyphony simultaneous multilingualism. And I'm going to head off a question that you may ask me, which is, uh, I have no idea what this means for my earlier argument. It presents a huge problem to the point I'm making earlier um, about the productively unstable relation between translation and multi-temporality in, in multilingual literatures. But that's my problem, not yours. When Abbas asks Spanish the inevitable post-lapsarian question of whether it regretted learning to lie, um, the novel says it paused and then it said, and it renders this in language, so you'll have to just forgive me with the pantomiming, um, I regret nothing at the top and then below it says I regret. At the core of Mel Mieville's peripheralist decolonizing humanism are the contingencies of ongoing translation. Humans are radically diasporic in his work because individual and social life consists of ongoing acts of partial and inadequate translation. Avis has no relation to human origins, and Mieville presents humans as motivated by movement, contact, and exotype exchange. Extrapolating from the off-modern to the deep future, Mieville charts an exiled multilingualism of the present. Thanks.